and I would like to introduce uh, Liz Cohen to you. Um, Liz is a photographer, a performance artist, uh, an educator, and also a car designer. And we will talk about one of her projects tonight. Um, she holds an MFA uh, in studio art from Tufts University, um, as well as um, a, a BA in philosophy. Sorry, that's a, a BFA in studio arts from Tufts, as well as a BA in um, philosophy and an MA from the California College of Arts. Uh, she has an extraordinary body, body of work which um, uh, has involved her working with a number of different individuals from uh, experts in cars in uh, Arizona and also in Michigan, as well as sex workers down in Panama, um, lowrider models, and many, many other people. We, she has a new project that she is embarking upon um, and we're going to be discussing a lot of her different work this evening. Um, she of course is a recipient of a Creative Capital Award as well as a Guggenheim and it is just an enormous pleasure to have her here. So thank you to you, our audience, for being here and thank you Liz so much for being with us and sharing your time with us. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah and April and Eric. It's really special to be here, and thanks for the nice introduction. So we may have talked to the chairs. That was yes. just one of the big things of the evening. <laughs> um, so Liz, do you want to start off by kind of explaining what we're looking at here? Yeah, so um, for tonight I put together um, just works that have to do with cars, you know, Spirit and Show, and um, this is a schematic drawing for a project that I worked on for over a decade uh, where I transformed an uh, East German Trabant into an El Camino in quotes. <laughs> so it basically, the, the wheelbase of the car, the heart of the car, the engine, um, and the length of the car all took on the design elements of the El Camino. And I grew up, um, are we having that? Um, I grew up in Arizona, uh, that's where I was born, and my, uh, my parents are immigrants from Colombia, and, um, and my parents had been um, active communists when they were young. So when I, when I was growing up, I was in this kind of situation that was very hybrid, it was, we were a little different, and we would, my parents would take us, um, for example, to the USSR or to China for vacation. So uh, that was, you know, it was the 80s, and it was, you know, like a kid of the Cold War, and, uh, and anyway, you'll see I was obsessed with, like, Nadia Comaneci and different kind of figures that um, kind of exemplify things from that period. This is a, um, a logo um, I designed for the project that has um, the, the green S is the Sachin ring, and that is the emblem for the Trabant. The Trabant is a car that was produced in East Germany from 1959 to 1991 um, during the East German era. And then the, um, the hammer and sickle, the hammer has the Chevy bow tie, and there's a sickle, and then the, the purple uh, object you see in the background is a hydraulic. And so hydraulics uh, were the technology I used to power the transformation of the Trabant to an El Camino. And so that is a technology um, that I was familiar with growing up in the Southwest that's used in low riding. So this next image um, is related, but also perhaps a step back from the Tremino itself. Yeah, so this is really the beginning. So I um, was about to go to Germany and I knew I wanted to work with a car. I didn't know about the Trabant yet. And I was living in San Francisco and I needed to raise some money um, for the car. I had just come off of doing a long project in uh, Panama, um, in Central America with a group of sex workers. And I was thinking about labor in that way. And I wanted to raise money to buy a car. And a friend was opening an artist-run space called Spanganga on the corner of 19th Street and Cap, for those of you that are familiar with San Francisco, and I threw a car wash. So that, this image is called Volvo, 
and you'll see a video now of my attempts to raise money washing cars. <coughs>
our identities and the way we walk through the world and the way that we're perceived that I think I don't think I even consciously in the beginning thought that that was what I would ever dive into but I had I felt urgency I guess around certain things and it started to express itself there's a bravery of what you're doing here. I mean, you know, despite the fact that you have a community around you, you are nevertheless a young uh, woman on the street and washing cars. I mean, it, it is an incredibly brave step. I mean, for me, it was also an opportunity to try on a kind of different self, or a different, not a different self, but a different way of being in the world. So, um, you know, that's not the kind of, that look isn't a look that I usually walk around in and at that time too I just had started growing my hair out I had very short hair um, and I had kind of a more boyish look and so it was also kind of exciting to try something out. This is a very interesting part of the video. Um, do you want to talk a little bit yes. about both what happened here and then what happened afterwards? Yeah, so this, uh, the, the guy in the orange shirt is Larry Salton, and I studied with Larry during grad school, and I had finished grad school a couple years before, and Larry, Larry came to the car wash, and he was really a father figure to me in many ways, and um, so anyway, that's Kelly and their dog, and Steve. And uh, and so we set up this photograph with the with the firefighters, and then many years later, I mean almost a decade later, this was a Polaroid, and I was exhibiting it in a gallery, and I got a cease and desist letter from a lawyer representing the San Francisco Fire Department because I think there had been some kind of trouble in the San Francisco Police Department at that time, and I don't know, I guess it was bad for the image. But I felt bad for these guys because they were so sweet. It was really nice of them to stop and like humor me for the photo and um, anyway. So if we now move on to uh, something a bit closer to the work upstairs, um, this is an incredibly powerful image. So this image is called Grinder, and this was um, this came from the first set of images I really shot of myself in a bikini that were still photographs. I mean, the bikini car wash, I didn't. Even, I don't even know if I considered it a piece at the time. It was just kind of this gesture to get something done. And um, and so these I set up in the shop that I was working in because I needed to find a way to broadcast what I was doing. I realized this was going to be a really long haul to build this car. And I thought of these as kind of these, um, like a trailer for a movie or a movie poster that announced like, oh, there's this woman, she's building this car, and she's doing it in this shop, and it's, it'll come one day to somewhere near you. And, and I had the realization that to become a part of the custom car world, there were three kind of archetypes. There were the, was the person that builds the car, the person that owns the car, and the person that represents the car um, in the magazines or on the cover of the car girl. And so I wanted to, I figured that those would be three things I could try out, and I could see how they played out, and um, what that would bring me in terms of becoming a part of the custom car world. But this is a really aggressive image. I mean, it, you know, it, it's, it, I mean, it's like genital panic with the submachine gun. I mean, this, this is a very aggressive image. I'm just learning how to use tools, and they're very powerful. I just think they're very powerful. <laughs> they can be used in many ways. <laughs> This one is called Air Gun, and um, so, you know, I was having a really good time um, getting to know the guys at the shop, and they were helping me a ton, and um, so, you know, this again, this was one of the first shoots, and one of the things that, in terms of the kind of parameters I was talking about for an experience that was interesting was happening is that, you know, what, what you see with the final photograph is very different than, with, than what's happening during the shoot, you know, and so I had, these kind of fake gel boobs I was putting in, and my friend was doing my hair and makeup, and it just, I think that the, the seeing how this is done was very, I mean, it's kind of funny, because I was, you know, directing this, I was looking at, you know, Polaroids, moving things around, the lights, and putting these boobs in and out, like taking things, and the guy saw it was funny, you know, but I think it was also this kind of opportunity to share how an artwork or a photograph is really constructed, you know? Uh, so that was part of what was happening. 
there too? Again, I, I mean, I think what is interesting is this um, way that you kind of build community and you build community into your work. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I was so grateful to be in the settings of the shops that they were hosting me, and I was learning a lot, and the, the work really became a lot about teaching and learning, and um, and so I was learning a lot, but I was sharing a lot, too, about what I was thinking about, how I was working, um, and so it was like this really beautiful exchange, and there will be an image that comes up soon of my... Um, mentor at the shop, Bill Cherry, who really taught me everything I know about, you know, fabrication, really, and using tools, and um, Bill's from Flint, Michigan, and he used to build cars for NASCAR, and, um, and he's just kind of this tough dude that would throw tools on my head when he was frustrated, <laughs> and, but no, he really, I mean, we're really dear friends, and he, um, he taught me everything, but so... Yeah, through him I learned how to use the tools and a new sense of humor. And this is another great one, I think, just the way you pass sort of seen and unseen in these uh, photographs. Yeah, this is the lunchroom, um, Chico and Abraham, and that Coke machine that you see in the background was this area where there were just people would just roast each other. So there were photographs that were just taken out of magazines and kind of looked like people with phrases and everyone was brutally making fun of each other. I mean, that kind of environment which was like, I don't know if I would call it constant hazing, but it was something very new to me. I grew up, my dad died when I was a teenager and I grew up with sisters. I mean, I grew up in this like woman household that we were, that humor was very distant from anything I had ever experienced before. So it was wild for me and I really, that space of the, the Great room it was um, just it was generative for me. It was interesting. This I think is another really interesting image because I think there is a movement from the images we've seen previously to this type of image. Yeah, I mean I think at this point there was already a discourse going on around the um, photographs with the bikini, around kind of my positionality and the politics of the image. And then I was invited to do an exhibition in Sweden at a space called Park Fabriken, and it was a four-month performance where I worked on building the car and worked with a trainer on my body. And, and the image of Stairs Hood is from the same series, and the four-month um, performance culminated in a photo shoot that was open to the public. So I was working out with this guy named Priester, and uh, when we were planning the shoot, I just thought it would be funny to objectify him, and so we decided that his head would be, you know, cut off. We had a lot of, it was a great time. We had a lot of fun together. And this one is called um, Ruth. And again, this one was to me just um, kind of a response to the discourse that was going around to just not be afraid of it and just say that, you know, sex is okay and that you know, there are many ways to interpret an image of the person that is in the image and what it might mean to that person or to their life or how, what it could even mean to society, so. And I think that brings up a really interesting point, but Eric and I were curating a show and installing the show. I think the, the placement of your work next to Richard Prince was really conscious on our part. And I, I mean, I think that, that while some people may see this and think about you know, some of the more exploitative images or the images of biker girlfriends that Richard Prince has used. I mean, I, I think it's really important to point out that your work is very different. It's very different because it's you and because you have agency over what you're doing, but it's also very different in that idea of the gaze. I mean, this is a subverting gaze. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, some of the things that I was thinking about was this idea that it's, it, it's really um, diminishing to make assumptions of what it means for a particular person that's been in an image, right? If you could imagine a, per, a woman who's a doctor, for example, in an abusive relationship and someone that's a model that's having, you know, that's empowered and having a great time, there's no reason why it follows that one thing necessarily leads to the next. It's situational, right? And so there was that and the idea also of flipping the script and the opportunity that I had, and also knowing that it's different. I'm trying things out, and I was very aware of that. And for me, it was useful, you know? So, I don't know if that. And from this, we go to something much more abstract. 
Do you want to talk about these? So these were um, kind of, a, for me, a piece that was a way of, of thanking Bill for letting me use his tools. So Bill has a toolbox that spans the size of this wall. And it's a really big deal in the automotive world to let someone into your toolbox. The tools come with the, um, the automotive technician. So it's part of the calling card. And um, so this is a series of 150 of Bill's tools. And they're um, reminiscent of Walker Evans' uh, Beauties of the Common Tool. And, um, and they have, the clusters have names that kind of have to do with shop talk. So MTCO, like measure twice, cut once, or FOS, fucking old school, or, you know, so they have these kind of things that these, things that Bill would say to me, or he, you know, the whole series is called the five Ps, which is um, proper planning prevents poor performance. And that's, that's something that every time I would mess up in, with the car, because I was learning how to really, this car was, I really built it from the ground up, so I had to learn even a lot about measuring. And so, like Bill's frustration at my clumsiness when I work on something all day and then have to take it apart. He just, dear, don't forget the five P's and, you know, and then start over. <laughs> this again, uh, I think, is much more about the physical work on the car. Um, and I would love for you to talk about this and then we can talk about sort of how the two come together afterwards. Yeah, so these are images from uh, a book I did of a build that's called, it's called Body Work. And um, so while I was um, building the car, I would just, you know, shoot snapshots every day of my progress. And um, here you can see me um, figuring out how to build a frame that was going to support the engine because I was taking out this little two-stroke front-wheel drive um, engine from the Trabant, a very small engine, and I was replacing it with a Chevy small block, which is a big, heavy engine, and so I had to take this car that had what's called a unibody construction and make it into a body over frame construction. And so I had to figure out how to cradle that engine and build something to, to hold the car that would also be able to get longer or shorter. So this is um, this is constructing the um, suspension. So this is a parallel parallel suspension. And uh, here you can just really see how I'm emptying out the car and just really to, to a shell, basically. So it's a shell of the Trabant. As I figured out how I was going to fit all of this technology in the car that would make it get longer and shorter, and, and how to turn a front wheel drive into a rear wheel drive when there wasn't room for the transmission, really. So um, that's kind of what you're seeing here. So you see the outriggers for the frame, and there you can see me figuring out the stencils for the floorboards and the firewall, which I had to move back. and. Um, figuring out the brake system. I really had to build every system of the car um, once I figured out that I wanted to do this transformation. I, I think this is a really interesting point because you yourself have, have talked about how, um, you know, there, I mean, first of all, the sculpture that you built is a working car. It is a car that can actually drive. It's not just a simulacrum car. Um, and I think that is really important. And then, you know, how certain people thought perhaps other people had done the work for you. Yeah, I mean, it was really important to me that it would be a functional car. I didn't want it to be a stand-in. And, and also for it to really work, since it was almost a social experiment for me, like, could I do something to become a part of something in a really meaningful way through labor? And, um, and it is interesting. I mean, I sweated this thing for 10 years and you never do anything like this all by yourself because it takes you know a lot of advice and there's certain things that you have to farm out but I really did the bulk of the labor and the fabrication and I think the craziest point was when uh, Low Rider magazine wrote about the piece and it really kind of diminished how much work I had done but it was still a huge honor to be in the magazine but I think it's just part of the turf that's the part that's interesting in terms of taking the three roles and seeing that for example, in, in, with the work, I think the photographs have been a lot, talked about a lot more than the aspects of labor that have to do with the project, the kind of labor performance. So this is the first time that the car got longer and shorter. So it's turning into the length of the LED up here. And the wheelbase is also, which is the distance between the wheels also 
that all can be all real things. So then I moved to Detroit and um, I really I wanted to finish the car and the kind of the land of GM and um, I ended up getting a teaching job at Cranbrook and I was able it kind of really the change in shop. So this was the third shop I worked at because before I was at Elwood Body Works in Scottsdale, which is what you saw, I had worked on the car for a year in Oakland at a lowrider shop called Worldwide Customs. But the kind of work I did there didn't really end up being a part of what happened to the car. But um, so this is Custom Creations in Sterling Heights, and this this shop was really like a step up in the sense that they had a lot of machining equipment. So it was very precision oriented. They put me on a build plate. Everything that was a little bit askew was squared up, and I learned a lot from, it was a very different environment than being in the Southwest, you know, being around all the kind of automotive suppliers, and just all the kind of stuff that was available, it was so easy to get anything, and, and also, um, I was there during the economic downturn, and so a lot of people had been laid off from the factories, and so there were, there were just all these people that loved cars coming through that, were really reinventing their lives with their knowledge and then just doing cool projects in the shop and it was an amazing, it was a really amazing experience to be there. And so here you're seeing the tear down and rebuild when I'm taking the car apart, starting to chrome things before putting it back together. This, this is the chroming. Yeah, this is chroming and I worked with really great people and then even the chassis of the car ended up being chromed, which you could probably only really do in a few places, and in Detroit there was a place that had a, a huge tank for that, and um, they stopped production for for a morning to, to help me out, so that was pretty amazing. Um, so this is the car, and it kind of, I would say it kind of finished state, because it's, it's never done, and I always find something else to do every time I pull it out, I'm like, oh, one more thing. Um, but so this is actually at the bridge here um, in the Hamptons, and um, yeah, so you can see the chrome chassis, and when it opens, originally I was going to have um, the panels um, kind of accordion out and cover everything, and then I, I became really interested in, in revealing kind of the functionality of the car and how it works and what its guts are, and preserving some of the, the trabotness, even as it was a little El Camino-ish. <laughs> So that's the original Trabant gas tank, so it's kind of funny for a, a V8 to be running on this little gas tank. So it can go about, I don't know, between, I think it could go with almost 50 miles before you need a new tank of gas. We're seeing the hydraulics here and the engine. You know, it's really interesting because I mean, there's um, an interview with Robert Irwin where um, Robert Irwin is asked about, you know, where his work comes from, and he said that on the East Coast, everybody assumed it came out of Zen Buddhism. And he had been a kind of a hot rod kid, and he said it came from, from his experience as somebody who built hot rods, because there were parts of the engine that he had polished that nobody would ever see. And, but he had the satisfaction of knowing that it had been polished. And I think there's there's a perfectionism which is at play here. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting when you talk about those kind of cultural differences too, going from working on the car in the West to the Midwest, the values were so different around cars. In Detroit, there's this uh, event called the Dream Cruise that happens every August. And, you know, people bring out their cars, but it's mostly classics, you know, when you see a kind of a custom car show, or that kind of like good guys in the West, or, um, you know, the low riders, just so much of it is about this kind of extreme modification, just radical modification, and so that 
I think I learned a lot from being in both spaces in terms of, I mean, it kind of sounds funny to say when you're looking at all this chrome, but in terms of being understated in some ways, <laughs> and then very kind of baroque and overstated in others. And so, you know, I, I made the decision to, to preserve the color of the, the original Trabant color instead of painting murals on the side of the car, you know, and um, those were kind of, um, you know, so yeah, that perfectionism is a, definitely a part of it, figuring out not the interior? Yeah, so the interior, I tried to preserve as much as I could from the Trabant, but, um, you know, I had to make that tunnel to fit the transmission into the car, and so I tried to integrate it with kind of dials and um, uh, gauges that were uh, reminiscent of uh, GM uh, gauges, and, uh, and then you can see the kind of switches for the hydraulics on top of the tunnel there. It's the Trabant steering wheel. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a hodgepodge, but I tried to preserve as much as I could. All set. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> um, so let's go. Yeah, let's go to Zwickau, Germany. So this is um, in the former East Germany, and um, at the time I was living in, in Detroit, and um, it was the kind of the first time I, I mean, it was the first time I was really experiencing a post-industrial condition. Um, you know, Phoenix has always been a growing city, a city that's on the up, and that was kind of what I knew, and I had lived in San Francisco and Boston, but Detroit was the first place that I saw that was having a kind of a different experience in that, and seeing kind of the abandoned factories, and I started to think about just how the brutality and um, the definitiveness of the change when, these, when there is a change in the kind of economy of, of labor. And I wanted to do something in kind of in honor of the um, the 30,000 um, workers that built three million cars over 30 years in, um, at this factory. And so I found this in Zwickau, and um, that factory with the kind of shadow of the letters you see at the top that was originally Porsche Parks, and Porsche was like the Henry Ford of Germany, and when the Soviets took over East Germany, they pulled down the letters and in 1959 made this into the Tremont factory. And that image was called uh, Black Execution. This is yellow push-up arch. And um, so I was thinking a lot about Nadia Comaniche and I was looking at, you know, I was thinking about the symbols of the Cold War for me as I was growing up and Nadia was a kind of hero. And, um, and I also was thinking about Jackson Pollock as this instrument of the Cold War, you know, in terms of showing this kind of a great American art. And um, so the naming conventions for these photographs uh, come kind of in the spirit of lavender mist, so yellow push-up arch. And push-up arch is a gymnastics move, so that's kind of the reference of, uh, to Nadia Comaniche, so yellow push-up arch. And these are inside the factory, and um, this is yellow inward turn. And the kind of amazing thing that I that happened when I was in here is I found a ledger um, that documented where the last 200 Trabants went. It was like this handwritten thing that was just like in a corner, like full of dust, and the offices had this kind of great wallpaper that was peeling off. It was kind of amazing how much was still in there. Part of it was being used as storage, and part of it was just kind of, well. This is Red Cossack. There's, there's a wonderful mixing, obviously, of um, iconography here, because you are taking on both a gymnastic iconography, um, obviously also a kind of social realist, artistic sensibility as well on here, but then there's also a lot of kind of cheesecake or almost soft porn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now for something completely different. I can get it to work. Oh, wait, we missed the video, I think. The, yeah, the hybrid course. So yeah, so I built the car and it was time to have a baby. And you'll see the celebration here. Can we turn the volume up a little? Sure. Ha <laughs> 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 
So how many months pregnant were you? I think I was like at eight months at that point. But it's so, you know, the, the project took place over so many years that the car meant so many, has meant so many different things to me over time. And like what it does meant different things. And so, yeah. I mean, I think it, it, it I mean, there is a taboo around the female body, especially when pregnant. Uh, I think it's something really interesting in, in what you've done there, which is sort of taboo breaking really present yourself in, in a way that, that recognizes continued female sexuality through pregnancy. I mean, I was just thinking about the Venus of Willendorf. <laughs> it's just <laughs> fertility. But um, no, I mean, I see it, you know, of course. Um, but, you know, it's funny. Some of the things, that, you know, I, I think it, what they might mean comes later, you know, in terms of it's a gesture, you know, it's something that happens. And, so how does your son feel about the car? <laughs> oh, I mean, he, I mean, he's like 10 and it has these buttons that make it move. I mean, come on, he loves it. And he gets to show his friends, so. So on the way to Marco. Yeah, so um, this was a really great uh, moment in the project. I was invited um, to Marco by Ballroom and um, I was able to do the test drive of the car. And again, it was very important to me that the car were functional, and I wanted the car to be able to go at freeway speeds, and I didn't know if it could. And the reason I didn't know if it could was because I, the car has a telescoping drive shaft in it. So when the car, when you make a rear wheel, rear wheel drive get longer, the drive shaft has to get longer. But you know, a, a drive shaft has to be balanced to not have vibration when the car is driving. And so, you know, it was a big, deal to figure, that took almost two years to figure out that drive shaft with, you know, writing engineers and writing different people and um, and actually it's what got the car written about in an automobile magazine and, you know, ignorance was, I had no idea that it was like a big deal to me, but four times telescoping drive shaft that balances short and long and can go 75 miles an hour, you know. So um, this was the test drive and I did it in a caravan and so I'm um, in the front with the Trabant, and then my husband and Rafi, my son, are in an El uh, 1973 El Camino that I took the uh, kind of measurements from, trailing behind with um, with uh, gas for me to do refills. So. <laughs> and so we drove from uh, Marfa to the uh, Mexican border and back. And then um, I really wanted to celebrate the kind of immigrant technology that um, that made the engineering of the car possible, the hydraulics, and so I just decided to shoot some photographs on the Rio Grande, and so you see Mexico, or the mountains in the background, and the ground is Texas, and um, this one is called Low Rider Builder and Child. This one is called Bird Hannah, um, it's just kind of a, a reference to Hannah Wilkie. I was thinking a lot about the way her work had been um, talked about and the kind of um, through, I think it's called Through the Large Glass, where she's, you know, in Philadelphia, and she's doing her, her video um, strip tease, and um, so anyway, I was thinking about that. <coughs> so the video of strip tease in front of the piece Mark by Marcel Duchamp. Yeah. It's called Raphael. And this was, um, this is an Espanol in New Mexico. So another thing that the car, I needed the car to compete in a custom car show, specifically in low riding. And uh, Espanola is considered the low rider capital of the world. And um, they have this really great, uh, the Main Street Showdown is this really kind of homegrown show. And to register for the show, you can't register online and you have to send a five by seven photograph of the car. If it's a four by six, you're disqualified. I mean, they have all these specifications with a money order and whatever. So I send in my stuff, I find out that I'm gonna be in the car show, and I buy a trailer, and I get ready to go to this car show. And I had been, 
you know, I've been going to car shows for years, and I had posted that little video in the beginning of the car getting longer and shorter for the first time on YouTube. And it had a lot of hits, but I didn't really know who was looking at it. And uh, so anyway, I arrived. I was really nervous about getting, like, even just driving with the trailer and not looking like a moron, and then getting the car off the trailer with some grace and um, entering the show. When I entered, the guy that's kneeling by my window is Frank Silva, and he's a three-time world champion lowrider. And he he greeted me and he said, Miss Cohen, we've been waiting for you. And he was so, like, he knew all about the car, and he was super excited. And um, it was, like, kind of an incredible moment for me because I didn't realize people have been following the bill, so. This is an extraordinary oh, image. Oh, yeah, so that's the car show. Um, and so the, um, the the floor tiles are the kind of garage tiles and the um, kind of Trabant beige and the Chevy orange, engine orange. And there's that floor map, the logo. And um, so I got first place in my category, which is subcompact radical. And, um, and then Frank was trying to convince me to go to the World Championship um, in Las Vegas because I qualified because I got an award at a super show. And this is where that kind of exercise of restraint that I had learned in Detroit and being understated came in. It's like, okay, he's like, you can take the World Championship. You're just going to have to engrave the chrome, etch the glass, do some murals. <laughs> I think it's okay. It's okay. So from here, I went on to Fresno, which was a very different kind of show, very tough show. Um, well, really different atmosphere. And then this is one of your <laughs> latest bodies of work. Yeah, so this is called Stories That Are Told by Others. And um, for me, this, this was a work I wanted to do to celebrate um, the women who you know, have influenced the kind of style and the attitude of low riding and in 2015 lower magazine stopped using women on the cover and then a little after there was it was either the second or third show of low riding at the peterson automotive and there was a decision made not to include sexualized images of women and so to me that basically erased 90 percent of the women who have participated in a rich way in the low riding culture and so um I wanted to, I have a big archive of magazines, and so I was going through my magazines, and um, I decided to put them on top of these really colorful automotive suede, and uh, look through kind of leftover parts that I had, and work with um, Bud Gonzalez, who was kind of one of the most famous constructors in low riding, to kind of enamel hand paint on the photographs and names of each of the models. So this is the first low rider magazine. This is Gloria Garcetti, and um, she was pregnant when um, this photograph was shot. And it's just, I feel like it just sets the tone for what it was, you know, it was, um, the, the folks that started the magazine were part of the Chicano movement, and it was this really kind of political, playful, irreverent moment, and I think like the style of the London fog jacket with the embroidery is just, it's like, so right on. And you've talked also about how these women, although on, on the magazines they may be sexualized, they nevertheless, I mean, there were serious discussions going on. I mean, the lowrider movement was about the politics, it was about the art, it was about the car engineering, but there was a place for women at the table. Yeah, and, the, and this conversation around, the same conversation that happens now around women and representation and objectification and the gaze and sexualization and the erotic, was happening then too, when we, when we get to this image, Mona Flores, she's considered the original bad girl, this is the first um, cover that has a bikini on it, and um, the women of Mecha, which is um, a Chicano organization, and the women of Lowrider got in a really big um, rift over this image in the beginning of the use of the kind of bathing suit in um, on the Lowrider cover. And so this was a really big move. Um, and you can see, I think the design of the magazines, I think, really shows how kind of homegrown, you know, especially when you look at the first one, you can see it's hand drawn, you know, low rider, and, um, and you'll see how the magazine changes over time, and I think the dynamics of the modeling changes over time. So in the beginning, these are people that are either family members or friends, or sometimes a person working on a car. Um, so here's Evelyn Guerrero. Mm -hmm. 
And you said this is the first time the name of the model was on the magazine. Yeah, cover. I think this is the this is I think one of the only ones I have that has the model's name on the cover. Yeah. And this is Steve Gonzalez, and she built the car. So this is a car that she built. Um, it, it's interesting to me that she's in the passenger seat. I mean, she might have decided to do that so you can see the chandelier and the, <laughs> the steering wheel. But, um, Christina Robard, Timothy Moore, 80s, I love that. Mm. And uh, this is Eni, and this one I love because it's so such a weird culture mashup. Because I mean, I'm not sure, but I feel like that looks like Brazilian carnival wear. <laughs> it has nothing to do with this kind of Cinco de Mayo or Aztec thing. And lowriding is, um, I think, from really early on became a very um, diverse kind of culture, people building the cars. You know, in the 90s, when I was really starting out in it, it was a really, um, it was a really black culture. There was a lot of um, stuff going on with hip hop and low riders. And so it's interesting, like what was going on in the magazine and what was going on at the shows were kind of divergent. Um, and so it's interesting too, just to think about um, in terms of also some of the discussion around low riding, how essentialist it can be sometimes. This is Dazza Del Rio. So Dazza is one of my heroes. She's like the Madonna of lowrider models. She is the icon. And um, and Dazza, every cover that she's been on are like the highest selling lowrider magazine. And her uh, one of her magazines when it came out, I think it was her Cinco de Mayo shoe, sold more magazines than Time magazine on the stands that month. So I mean, she's kind of really huge. And. Um, and this was Lowrider's first time in Japan, and so um, this was like the Japan issue. And Daz and I became friends. I met her, I think, in 2003 at the Fresno at a show, and she was merchandising around herself and making a ton of money. And so she had her own kind of booth, and her mom would have managed money. She'd always travel with her mom, Rosa. and. Uh, and I was just like fascinated with her, and I was asking her about posing. She said, could you do a favor? Could you come to the bathroom with me? She didn't want to go to the bathroom alone. And so we became friends. So that was kind of like the beginning of my relationship to Dalva Del Rio, who I've recently done a lot of work with and I'm continuing to work with. And she's a perfect example of why, I mean, when, when there was this decision not to have sexualized images around the cars, perhaps what the conversation should have turned more towards was how do you give more agency to these women on the covers or around the cars? Yeah, and I think like in terms of the art direction of the photographs and magazine covers, I think you see how they changed over time too. In the beginning, I have a feeling it's like a lot more of a conversation, it was more playful. And then as the magazine was bought by these bigger kind of conglomerates of trade magazines and stuff, I think that the dynamic also changes in terms of the design and what could happen. But but yeah, I think there are opportunities there too in terms of like who's doing this, why are they doing it, you know, why is she doing it, you know, I mean there are different reasons and um, and Daza um, has a huge um, kind of life around uh, protecting animals and um, advocating for the, you know, good, well, treating animals well and she's re rescues dogs and she's, she has this she has a really huge, rich life, and this is part of her rich life. Is so, um, can you go back to the, or what is the next one? That's the next one. Okay, we can, we can, okay so that's Dazza Del Rio and I when we met um, in 2003 in Fresno, and that's um, Lisa Lyon, um, the great uh, performance artist who also um, happened to be Robert Mapplethorpe's lover and most photographed subject. And um, I was thinking about this kind of erasure of, um, of women and erasure of the woman's body and the kind of the way work is received. And I learned about Lisa Lyon when I was a graduate student and I was always kind of obsessed with her and thinking about her in terms of endurance. And she was um, the first woman bodybuilding champion and it was the only time she, she competed once and she trained with Arnold Schwarzenegger and it was this thing that she um, worked on to do and then she, um, you know, she kind of disappears after 
these photographs from Naval Corp, she, this show of his work was not well received at the time. And um, I've been trying to kind of find her through the internet, and it's really interesting. She doesn't have a social media presence. The last thing you can find out about her online is that in, I think it was like in 2000, she was inducted into the Bodybuilders Hall of Fame, but there are no photographs of her. When LACMA did um, the big Naval Corp show, they did a documentary, and I was like, okay, I'm sure I'll find a talking head of her in there, and she's the only person that's interviewed who is just her voice. So she's this big mystery, you know, and it's like this kind of person that is kind of a race but has so much power. I mean, for me at least, she's like this hero and this like looming presence. And so I wanted to do a piece that was kind of intergenerational and a conversation that Daz and I are roughly the same age. And Daz's um, parents, one of her parents is Colombian and one of her parents is Peruvian and I'm Colombian. And, well, my family, my parents were Colombian. And, um, so we have these kind of weird connections and kind of with aging that we have been talking about, kind of like figuring out using our bodies again and working out. And so I wanted to have this kind of ghost of Lisa Lyon in her 20s, you know, when she did those photographs in the bodybuilding. Daza and I like hovering around 50 and this kind of like ghost of Lisa Lyon in her like mid to late 60s with us again and we were kind of like, hoping that she kind of knew, <laughs> you know? so, so I invited Dazza to Phoenix, and um, we did this series of photographs um, called Body Magic that after um, Lisa Lyons' book, and, um, and we're again against automotive suede, so some of those, they're called synergy suede, so similar to those bright and colored suede, they use magazines here, I use them um, black, white, and gray, um, and so these are kind of reminiscent of the Maple her photos, but um, we're also playing around and they're doubles and this one's called Ruffle. And this one's called Bale. Um, when Jazz and I started talking about doing these and we had started doing the magazine photographs, her husband had just died by suicide. And so this kind of image for her became really important when we were talking about what we were gonna do and she was thinking about the more. So this photograph took on a lot of kind of different dimensions for us. This one's called the Union. This one's Suspender. And I think that is the end of the images. Um, before we do open it up for questions, and, and we would like to do that, obviously, um, I'd like to talk to you, or, or maybe just have you reflect slightly about what it is to use your body in this way for the last 20 years? How, I mean, how has that changed? How has your view of your own body changed? And, and I mean, how, how long do you think you will continue to work in this way? I mean, it's funny. It probably seems obvious to everybody else, but I've just had the kind of recognition recently that I've been making the same image for 20 years, you know, and I'm like, why am I obsessed with this image, you know, I, I don't know why, you know, but um, the, with the, well, I mean, it's a lot harder to do this now, you know, to do these photographs, I was working out three hours a day for like six or seven months, and I thought I was going to get way more pumped than I would, you know, if I would have done this in my 20s or 30s, it would have been a whole different kind of story, I think. Um, and I just have more going on in my life, too, just more responsibilities and kind of different things to, to juggle. Um, but to me, I mean, it was it's interesting just to see how the body changes over time. It was interesting to see Dad do this again. You know, she hadn't done it for 14 years, you know, and, um, and why not? I don't know. Why not? I mean, it's it's interesting to see for me just the, the way it changes, but I don't I don't know how much I can say about it except for that I'm preoccupied with the way my body is changing right now. So with that, maybe open it up to questions. Yes. Those are the kind of pinups that you see 
in, in automobile repair shops with that way you got that idea from or that just came out of doing something more than you Well, no, it came out of that and seeing the lowrider magazine covers because I've been looking at the lowrider magazines before I started building a car. So, you know, that kind of image was already in my mind. And I mean, I think it's also just an image that culturally, you know, has existed for, you know, before I was alive, you know, so it's kind of something I wanted to play with. But that's also why it became really interesting to me that the shop was my main audience when I was, um, when I was shooting those photographs too. It was a performance to shoot, the actual production of the photographs was a performance. And to have that deconstructed in the very environment where you do see those images was something that was interesting to me. I've noticed, um, so I'm 74 years old, so I've been around for a while, and especially around cars. In fact, I've been 124 cars. And my daughter, who's 43, I remember years ago, women never drove Porsches. Today in the Hamptons, there are more women driving Porsche convertibles than men. Um, and I've noticed my 43-year-old daughter likes to race 911 GT3s on the track. So women today are finding their place in cars. Do you feel that I mean, I think they, they always had one, too, you know? I mean, there are, like, amazing um, photographs of women repairing cars in the really early days. I mean, it wasn't as popular, you know, and it wasn't something that was encouraged. But um, definitely it's always been kind of around, and I guess it is much more, popu much more popular. I mean, I think, you know, I think women have always, you know, it's perpetual, um, like what we do is so scrutinized, you know? Um, there's not kind of a right way to ever do anything. Like, you know, these kinds of photographs are scrutinized, but like, why not have the ability to try out everything? Um, so I think that's probably part of that dynamic. So can you talk about your decision to, uh, when you did this series, to uh, work out and return your body to that younger, idealized state and not photograph your 50-year-old natural body? Well, I think I was thinking about Lisa Lyon, and so that was kind of that dialogue with her. Um, and then, of course, it's, it wasn't a bad thing to become fit. I mean, I really hadn't, I don't know, I think, you know, I had my son and then I had a lot of responsibilities I teach had a lot of things going on, and I wasn't like horribly out of shape, but it was a, it was an opportunity. I did see this as an opportunity, but also, you know, on a conceptual kind of the foundation of the piece is this dialogue with Lisa Lyon, and so I had to do it. Yeah. Thank you. This is really interesting. You're in the photo, so I'm wondering who's taking the photo, and whether you are using a self timer or are you working with a photographer, and whether you use the same photographer, or? No, I mean, I'm always just working with different people, but um, so as the project projects have gone on, they happen in different ways. So in the earlier photographs, I was working with a, I had two Pentax 6.7s, and one of them had a pole right back on it, so I could, you know, roughly figure out what I wanted to do. I had someone operating the camera, and then I would look at the Polaroid, and I would say, "Okay, we're going to move lights here. I'm going to I'm going to move my body here." And we would try things until it was right, and then we would photograph it. And then when I started working um, with a digital camera, then it was much easier because you can have the monitor facing you, and then it's much easier to see what's going on. And um, so that is more in real time. But yeah, I've always worked with just kind of whoever's, um, you know, around that knows what they're doing. And so I've always hired people to help me, yeah. Thank you. Is it, is it on? Hi. OK. Um, I really love the whole idea of you being in the shops, you know. And I kind of feel like, as artists, so much of what we do, when you do a certain kind of work, is convincing people to do something that 
either they don't they don't want to do, they don't know how to do, they don't, you know, that you know that they have the ability to do it, but you're kind of like pushing them to do something. And so I guess I just wanted to know living in that space in the shop, both because you know, you're you're have this idea that you need these people to help you realize, you know, and as well as you're photographing yourself sort of in that space. Just how much sort of uncomfortable tension was there that you had to live with and sort of dig into, or was there any? Well, there were a lot of dynamics over a long period of time. So, I mean, one thing with all my work is I've never, I've never worked with people that didn't want to be there, and oftentimes I've worked with exhibitionists and people that really want to be seen, you know, and so. There's never kind of a conflict around participation, I think. But I think the dynamics, the relationships between people, like for example, at Elwood Body Works in Scottsdale, I was there for four years. So, you know, there's push and pull, and it's a big impact. Having me there was a big impact. I still can't believe how generous Don Barcelotti, the owner of the shop, was because he gave me a bay at the shop for four years. I took up a lot of space, but I think also it was a lot of fun for them, you know, in terms of it was a diversion from kind of the day-to-day -day grind, and I think everyone that works on cars dreams of um, doing a custom car, but they're just like a big money drain, and they take a lot of time, and I had the kind of privilege to be able to, to do it, and so I think in different ways we were all living vicariously through each other, so I mean, it was a big experience to go through together, so there's a lot of affection, you know, at the end of it all. But yeah, the dynamics sometimes Sometimes we hated each other. <laughs> it was a long time. <laughs> Lots of things happened. It's very impressive that you have it done. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'm incredibly jealous at your vocabulary about cars. Like when you were talking about a firewall and a, I can't remember all the terms. I was thinking like, this, I mean, just that to have acquired a kind of vocabulary from another world, is a certain kind of empowerment. I thought it was just really interesting listening to you talk about it. So that, linguistically, is sort of a mashup, and then the Trevant and the El Camino are, I think I think the Trevantino is an incredible mashup. I just think it's such a cool project. And so subtly, politically transgressive, because you force this El Camino into this East, Ger East German body. and. And this too with Lisa, it's so funny that you're bringing up Lisa Lyon because I was completely like fascinated by her. I even did some bodybuilding, not very successfully, but I thought she was an amazing kind of version of a certain kind of feminist when Mabel Thorpe made her famous. I guess you would have to say that he did. And I have not wondered where it came of her, but this whole thing of mashing up seems to be this and then you were saying that your origins are Colombian, but so communist, but not because you grew up in America. Yeah, I grew up here. How do you feel like we're the body magic? Where's the mashup? Or do you think that there, there is? I mean, the mashup is like bringing Gaza into the picture. I mean, you know, it's like this thing of bringing, colliding all these different worlds, like the lowrider modeling with the bodybuilding, with, you know, the kind of. At the time, you know, I don't think they seem that way as much now, but at the time, what Lisa Lyon was doing looked really androgynous. I think they look less androgynous when we look at them now. Um, and, you know, this is what Dazza does and what I've been doing is hyper femme, you know? And so, I mean, I think all that mashup of the way those things collide and how they can dialogue is really fascinating, the kind of things that we can try on, right? And. Um, with, without, you know, with the, and, and still be authentic to like ourselves, you know, to like the community, community ourselves. But, um, so, yeah, I think the mashup just comes in bringing those kind of different worlds together and that kind of like, you know, imaginary intergenerational exchange. Uh, I had a question about the magazine covers. Okay. Did you have those bikinis made? Did you design them? I mean, did you have them replicated? The, the oh, you mean when I? No, I like. No, no, no. Those were just like the 
all the props I used with the magazines were things that I had more parts that I kind of used over the car. Even that white one that was, yeah. So it looked kind of like one of Flora's bathing suits. So I was like, oh, I'll put this one on here. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate the feature. That looks fine. I have two burning questions that relate to the early uh, car wash. How much money did you make? Oh, it's so embarrassing, Eric. I can't believe you're asking this. I have to be honest. I broke even. <laughs> so the, the, the big issue was I thought I was going to make a lot of money selling hot dogs, and I rented that hot dog cart. <laughs> and, you know, we were selling boiled hot dogs when there was someone with a cart selling hot dogs wrapped in bacon just a few feet away. <laughs> so, you know. And the other part of that question is, was the fire truck just going by? It was, or? Yeah, they, they drove by over and over. Yeah, and then, you know, I kind of asked them to stop, and I was like, hey guys, do you want to, you know, and they were like, will we stop for a minute, you know? And they were, were you at all nervous that they were going to ask you to wash it? <laughs> uh, I was, actually, because I could barely walk at that point. It was, you know, I did that for six hours, and I was carrying those buckets of water with the heels, and it was the first time I was kind of doing anything like that, and I had, was not even prepared for what that was going to do for my, to my feet, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's very impressive. I, I, I have a, a, a tangential question. One of the things I've never understood in the lowrider culture is the rocking of the car. And that's, once that's achieved, that, that's a very uh, complex effect and it produces, it's humorous. But uh, what is, what is, is there a, a semiotic to that that I'm missing somewhere? Yeah, I mean, it's called clowning. So uh, it's called oh. clowning. Clowning. So, you know, when, um, after World, so during World War II and when people worked on airplanes, I mean, this is one version of the history, there are many versions of this history, but one version of the history is that um, people learned about hydraulics working on the planes during World War II, and then after World War II, there was this kind of white hot rodding culture that was all about perfection and tuning, right? And then in um, in California and in the Southwest, there was um, you know a lot of discrimination against Chicanos, and people started lowering their cars, and you know there were Zuzu riots and different things happened. But there was this idea that you know it was it was illegal to lower your car past this place. There was a measure that if your car was too low, it was you would get a ticket. And so people started putting hydraulics to kind of clown the police officers, right? So if you saw a cop, you would raise the car to a regular ride height. And then it became more about being low and slow and, you know, kind of an existential, I mean, it's like graffiti. It's like an existential gesture that's like, I'm here. You know, you need to stop and you need to acknowledge me and I am here. And so, and, it, and then this is very playful with the clowning and the cars going up and down. And so, I mean, there's a, there's a politics to it. Any other questions? Well, I would like you just to join with me in thanking Liz for being here tonight.